Hey everyone, welcome back and let's write some more neat code today. So today let's solve maximum alternating subsequence sum. This is a problem from this morning's leak code contest and I'll probably also be solving a problem from this afternoon's leak code contest as well. So the first thing I wanna mention is that this is a dynamic programming problem and I have a dynamic programming playlist that I think will be helpful to understand this problem. In particular, I would recommend taking a look at this problem, longest increasing subsequence. This is a very similar problem to that sub to this uh, problem and I think if you need help this is a good video to watch the link to this playlist will be in the description if you want to take a look but assuming you know what a subsequence is we want to find the max alternating subsequence of this input array Basically, by alternating, they mean that the, so if we had a subsequence in any particular order, right, we skip two values, three values, who cares, right? We have three values. The first value is going to be added. The next value is going to be subtracted. The next value is going to be added, et cetera, et cetera. No matter where they lie inside of the array, right, no matter how much space is between these values, because it's a subsequence, we're going to be adding the first, subtracting the second, et cetera, et cetera. That's pretty much what they mean by re-indexing. And for this input example, you can see that just the first three values is the subsequence, plus four, minus two, plus five is gonna give us seven. That's the largest alternating subsequence you can get. So how can we solve this problem? I'm gonna show you how to solve it in linear time and constant memory, but the first solution I'm gonna show you is the linear time memory as well, the memoization. Then we're gonna get into the true dynamic programming solution. So what we're trying to know is we're allowed to start at the first value, right? Pretty much take the entire array. And of course, the first value we always choose is going to be the even value, meaning it's always going to be the positive value that we add. The next one is going to be the negative value, right? If we end up adding the first value, but we're also allowed to skip the first value, right? We're looking for a subsequence. There's no, like, no one's forcing us to take the first value. We are allowed to skip it. So we have two decisions, right? From this first value, we can choose to take it. We can choose to add four, right? Plus four, or we can choose to skip it, right? Don't do anything, right? That's our first decision. Okay, th th so that's a pretty straightforward decision. But now what are we trying to do? Now we have a couple sub problems, don't we? So we already removed four from consideration. In this path, we added four. In this path, we didn't do anything, right? I'm just gonna put an X, I guess, to indicate we didn't do anything. Okay, so now we added four. What's our next decision when we added four? Okay, the next value we're at is two. So we have a couple of choices, right? We can choose to subtract two. We have to subtract two because the, the previous value was added, right? So we can choose to subtract two or we can choose to do nothing, meaning we can just skip the two value. I'm gonna put an X to indicate we're skipping, right? We can skip that two value. Okay, what about this path where we actually skipped the four altogether? So we actually haven't added anything here yet. So when, we're, when we come to this two, we're not gonna subtract two because we never added anything in the first place. The first value always has to be added. So we have a choice of adding two or skipping two, right? So as you can see, this path is gonna be plus four minus two. This path is just plus four. This path is plus two. This path is we didn't even do anything, right? Let's just continue this tree. So now we come to a five. If we previously subtracted a value, we have a choice of adding five or doing nothing, meaning we skipped the five, right? And from here where we where we skipped subtracting a value, we're, we're, if we get to a five, we're, we have to subtract it, right? We can't add it because the previous value four was already added. So we subtract five in this case and the other case we don't do anything. So it's getting really messy now. But you know what, I'm just not even gonna continue this portion of the decision tree because we know that the solution does not lie here, right? If we skip the first value and just add a two, we're never gonna get the max solution. We know that this is what the max solution is. So let's just assume we finished our tree. So which one of these paths is maximized? This path is four minus two plus five, that's seven. This path is totals up to positive two. This path totals up to negative one. This path totals up to positive four. So obviously this path was the greatest. That matches up with what they had in the solution. The total is going to be seven and we can return seven. Now, obviously this is a decision tree. The time complexity could be two to the power of n, but how can we cache this? We can use DP to cache, but what key value are we gonna use to cache? Well, we're gonna use the index 
I that we're allowed to start at, right? Because from the beginning, from the root, obviously we're allowed to start at the, the first index, but once we've used the first four or skipped it, then the sub problem becomes we're at the next level or the next number, the second position in the array, basically I plus one, right? We can't go backwards, but we can choose any of the remaining elements. But we know that we could have gotten to a value, like we could have gotten to two, being able to subtract it or we could have gotten to two being able to add it which is what we did over here you can't see because it's crossed out so we actually need a second key which could be either even or odd i'm going to use a boolean for that so this is going to be the key value for our dp obviously the value itself is going to be okay so let's say we started here right dp from index i think that's index one right so i is one in this case and is even or odd true let's say even is true odd is false in this case obviously it's odd so the second key value is going to be false Right, so this is kind of how we would do it, caching at least. And then what would be the value that we actually store? Well, from here, what was the maximum uh, subsequence sum we could have gotten? This is a positive three, this is negative two. So obviously it was positive three. That's like the sub problem, right? And then when we go back up recursively, this position is gonna use the result of the sub problem. Now, how many different uh, sub problems could there be? Obviously I, which is gonna be the length of the input array. So let's say that's N. And for true or false, it's just gonna be two different values each time, right? So it's really the overall memory complexity is two times N. Of course, that just reduces to big O of N. So that's the memory complexity. That's also going to be the time complexity because we're not gonna have a nested loop or even any loop at all inside of our recursive function. That's what I'm gonna show you uh, coming up. And I'll, once I show you the recursive code, building out the dynamic programming solution is actually pretty straightforward. Okay, so now let's finally get into the code. So this is the recursive code. I'm not writing it out. I'm just gonna show you because what I'm gonna write out is the dynamic programming solution. So of course we have a cache the way I'm using this cache is not a two-dimensional array or anything. I'm just using a hash map just because I'm really lazy. So obviously one base case is if we reach the end of the array, what's going to be the max subsequence of an empty array? Of course, that's going to be zero. Another base case is if we've already computed this value in our cache. Now you can see the parameters I'm passing in. Let me erase this comment. Uh, the parameters I'm passing in is I for the index, even for true or false. If even is true, that means it's even. That means we're allowed to add the current value. That means we're, the position we're at is the even position. If it's false, that means we're at the odd position, meaning we're going to have to subtract the uh, value. So if this is already cached, then we can return the value that's cached. Otherwise, we're going to say, okay, our total is going to be, if even is true, then nums of i is going to be positive. If even is false, then nums of i is going to be negative. So we're going to subtract it, right? That's kind of what I'm doing here. And then we're not doing a loop. We're just making those two decisions I showed you in the decision tree. Either we're allowed to add the total value, regardless of whether it's positive or negative, basically the decision where we include this value. And in that case, what we're gonna call DFS on is of course I plus one, we're looking at the next position, but then we're gonna take the opposite of whatever our even is. If even is true, we're gonna set it to not even, which is gonna be false. If even is false, we're gonna set it to not even, which is true, right? So we're gonna change whatever that even sign happens to be. This is if we included the current value. We can also choose to skip the current value, which is the second decision. You can see I'm not adding the total to it, right? I'm skipping it, but I'm still doing I plus one, but I'm not changing the sign, right? If we're skipping the current value, I'm not required to change the sign. I shouldn't change the sign, right? So we're taking these two decisions, taking the maximum of them. Of course, this is recursive. We're taking the maximum of it, caching it, and then returning what's already been cached. And then when we call our, we're calling our DFS starting from position zero. And of course, the first value we add is always going to be even. So we only have to pass in true for this function. We don't have to pass in the zero and pass and false because the first value is always going to be added. So then once we return that, you know, that's the entire solution. So this is the same idea I'm gonna use in the DP solution, but we actually don't need an entire DP cache. You can see that DP of I only depends on two values. It depends on DP of I plus one, which is the opposite sign, and it depends on DP of I plus one, which is the same sign. So so I'm gonna I'm gonna First thing I'm gonna do is now when we start our DP solution, I'm gonna have two variables, some even and some 
odd. Basically, these are going to be, sum even means that the first value in this subsequence was added. The sum odd means the first, sub, the first value in this subsequence was subtracted. Initially, they're both going to be zero. That's the base case. But we're going to go for index i starting at the end of nums, nums, length of nums minus one. And we're going to keep going until we get to the beginning of the array. This is just how you do it in Python. And I'm going to have a variable temp even, right? Because we don't want to overwrite this sum even variable just yet. These are always going to be what the previous result was, and then we're going to update it. But so temp even is going to be if nums of i was added. So I want to say, okay, plus nums of i, right? But what are we adding nums of i to? Of course, we want sum odd, right? Because sum odd is the subsequence if the first value was added subtracted this value is being added so so that's how we're we're allowed to basically if we included nums of i now what happens if we skipped nums of i what's the max sum possibly going to be then it's just going to be whatever sum even was right we're skipping nums i so we're just taking whatever the max subsequent sum was if we skipped nums of i so when we take the maximum of these two that's how we're computing temp even right now, let me copy and paste this because we also remember we need to be able to compute. We need to, we're, we're, temp even is basically what's going to replace sum even and temp odd is what's going to end up replacing sum odd, right? So we're basically doing the opposite if the nums of i was actually being subtracted, right? Because if it's if the first value is odd, that means the value has to be subtracted. So let's change this sign. Some, so this nums of i is being subtracted. Now, if our subsequence is starting odd, right? Temp, temp odd, that means this is a subsequence where the first value is odd. That means we have to take nums of i, which is being subtracted, and add it with some even, right? If the first value, if the value we're including is odd, then the remaining portion has to start at an even value. So this is if we included the current value. If we skip the current value, then we're just going to take the max of this and some odd. I know this is kind of confusing when you maybe I'm just naming the variables poorly, but I think if you follow the logic that I wrote down here, it'll probably make more sense because this is exactly what we're doing up here. We're not using extra DP memory. We're just using the two previous results, some even, some odd. So once we've computed these temp even and temp odd, we're, we've basically updated the above variables. So now we're just going to uh, reassign them. So some are going to be updated to temp even and temp odd. So we have a, we've updated our variables and then we're going to go ahead and return the result. Now, what is the result going to be? Is it going to be some odd or some even? It's going to be some even because remember the first value that we're adding is always going to be even. So we want the max alternating subsequence where the first value is even, not where the first value is odd. So this is what we're going to return. Let me just run it to prove to you that it works. Since we're returning up above, this code is actually not going to be executed, even though I have it written down here. So as you can see, this solution does work. I'm not sure why it's only 16%, 1200 milliseconds, but I'm pretty sure this is a linear time solution with constant memory. So this is about as efficient as you can get for this problem. So I hope that this was helpful. If it was, please like and subscribe. It supports the channel a lot, and I'll hopefully see you pretty soon. Thanks for watching.